This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today we'll discuss the public education system and should Christians be concerned about changes in education policy. I'll be joined by former Michigan State Senator Patrick Kolbeck. Also, wisdom is spoken of in the Bible as a powerful tool God gives us. I'm going to ask Pastor Kyle seriously why he believes wisdom is something every Christian should be praying for to have unleashed in their life. But first, does God allow suffering? Does He cause it for our punishment or to learn some principle we haven't grasped? Rebecca McLaughlin has a PhD in pastoral studies from Cambridge University and is the author of this book, Confronting Christianity. I'm going to ask her what is God's role or responsibility with our suffering? Rebecca, there's a question here that I, I think many, many, many people ask when they're challenging Christianity is that, uh, well, there's two questions really. How could a loving God send people to hell? But maybe a greater question than that is how could a loving God allow so much suffering in the world? Mm -hmm. why, why do people mm -hmm. suffer and why do Christians suffer? If we're, we're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, why do, why do we suffer? Mm. Great questions, yeah. We tend to come to the scriptures with this idea that if God loved us, he couldn't intend for us to suffer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I absolutely love the verse, Romans 8, 28, which says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And you think, great, you know, let's yeah. put that on the coffee mug. Everything's going to turn out for good because I, I love Jesus. And ultimately that is true. But if you read on in that verse, it talks about us being conformed to the likeness of Christ as our good. And if we think about the life that Jesus led and the work that he did, it, it was a life of suffering and it was a life that culminated, culminated in his death and resurrection. And I think there, when we have the death and the resurrection, the crucifixion and the, the glorious rising again, we have a little glimpse of, of where we are and ourselves in the Christian story. So Jesus has died in our place. He has taken God's punishment for us. He has defeated death for us. So we do not have to be afraid to die. However, we are absolutely nowhere promised an, an easy life as Christians. In fact, if you look um, through the Bible, you'll find that it is a book written by suffering people for suffering people. Mm -hmm. And pretty much on every page of the scriptures, we see this. I mean, possibly not in the Song of Songs, like that may be the one exception to this rule. Pretty much every book of the Bible is talking to suffering people. And um, a, a question that we need to ask ourselves is what could possibly be worth all of this suffering, whether it's our own or suffering of um, friends or suffering that we see around the world. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' astonishing claim is that he is. He is the one who is worth all this suffering. Um, for me, uh, the most powerful uh, um, chapter in the Bible on this is, is John chapter 11, when we read about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Yeah. And it's not because of the headline news, you know, Jesus raises a man from the dead, which is an important part of the story. It's the conversations that Jesus has with Lazarus's sisters in the run up to that. So if you remember the story, mm -hmm. Mary and Martha mm -hmm. are friends with Jesus. Their brother is sick and looks like he's gonna die. But great news, they know the healer. So they call Jesus, you know, send a message to him and they say, you know, Lord, the one you love is, is, is sick, come. And the Bible says to us, because Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, he didn't come. Because he loved them, he waited four days and let Lazarus die. And then he came and even then he doesn't just come and say, okay, I'm here to, I'm here to raise Lazarus from the dead. Uh, Martha meets him and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, he will do for you. And Jesus says, yeah, your brother will rise again. And it's like that theological answer, you know, one day everything will be okay. She says, yes, Lord, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But you can almost hear her frustration, like, yeah. what about now, Jesus? What about now? I need, I, I need you to do something now. Don't give me the theological answers. And Jesus looks into this grieving woman's eyes and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord. So Jesus is saying to her, what you most need right now is not me to raise Lazarus from the dead. It is me. I am the resurrection and the life. So he has that conversation with her. And then I love the next step. So he goes, and Mary comes out and says the same question, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And he goes with the sisters to the tomb and he cries with them. He weeps with them. So we are in a relationship with someone who not only um, has the power to heal our suffering, but also has the compassion to weep with us in our suffering. And in both of those pieces, Jesus um, is able to pursue relationship with Mary and Martha. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. 
we also have the one man who can call a dead man out of his grave. And so the question for us is, is where are we in the story as we're suffering? And the Bible will say to us, if we're, if we're Christians, that however much suffering we're enduring now, we're not at the end of the story. That we're in relationship with the one who is meeting us and being intimate with us in this suffering. And actually, this may be a way we can experience him that we could not have experienced him without the suffering. But we are also in relationship with the one who can raise the dead and will one day wipe every tear from our eyes. And you look at a, at a book like Job and people say, well, God doesn't cause suffering. He doesn't create cancer. He doesn't give these things. He released Job to, for the enemy to, to, to cause these problems. Or we're, we live in a fallen world. Does God really, does he want us to walk through that mm. suffering? Does he cause any mm. of it? Mm. Yeah, again, I mean, I'd go back to John 11. It's a very interesting moment when Jesus is weeping outside Lazarus's tomb. And the, the people observing say two things. First, they say, oh, look how he loved him. But then others say, hmm, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also stopped Lazarus from dying? And the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, it seems very deliberate that Jesus wanted Lazarus to be dead before he came. He wanted that suffering to happen, both for Lazarus and for his sisters. So I think when we come to the Bible with this idea, we're, we're sort of trying to get God off the hook mm -hmm. of intending suffering for his people. I think we have a really hard time. And not least because God intended for the person he most loved in all of history, Jesus Christ, he intended for him to suffer and die. I think we have a really hard time kind of getting God off that hook. And I don't think we actually need to. Well, we like to say God is good all the time, all the time God is good. And we think mm -hmm. this is, these are not good things. Is it are, the way we define God's goodness? Yeah, again, I, I think we need to um, have a, a high view of, of God's sovereignty and God's knowledge of what is good for us and what is not. And um, as a parent, I experienced this. I mean, you take your baby to get immunized and you are holding this little little baby while strangers make them hurt mm -hmm. for no reason. I mean, for no immediate reason. They are not sick right now. And a stranger is sticking needles into their body and the baby's crying and looking at you with this like look of absolute, like, how could you do this to me? How are you letting me down like this? You're just making me hurt for no reason. And you as a parent know that it, is, it really is for a reason. Um, but but the, the baby doesn't know that. And I think we need to recognize that we are infants in the hand of God mm -hmm. and that he really does know what's, what's good for us and, and what often feels extremely painful for us is something that he promises he is working for our good. I'm not saying that's easy, but I think it's what the scriptures say. Yeah, it's, it's never easy. Uh, and, and researching this book, and, uh, and all the research you've done as an apologist. Uh, you spent a lot of time in God's Word. Is there anything that you've discovered, anything that you've wrestled over yourself that was tough to get your faith around or tough to get your, your mind around? You said, this, this scripture or this concept, uh, I, I just, God's going to have to reveal something special to me to, to be able to accept this. Mm -mm. I think the, the most challenging chapter for me to write for various reasons was a chapter, I think it's chapter 10, which is, uh, doesn't the Bible condone slavery? Yes. I think it's a particularly important question um, for uh, Americans with the history of, of slavery in this country. And it's something that I hadn't done a lot of research on prior to writing this book. Most of the other chapters were things I'd actually been you know, mulling over and mm -hmm. researching for at least a decade. Yeah. But this was something I was coming to more fresh. And as I dug into the scriptures, um, I, I saw time and again that actually, you know, both in the Old Testament, where um, clearly there is a practice of slavery, and even you know Abraham um, has, uh, you know, ends up sleeping with his his Hagar. wife, slave girl Agar, mm -hmm. and and you read that and you think, oh my goodness, like the headline news, the the first person God chose to be the sort of um, the patriarch of his entire people is having sex with a slave like that is that's completely awful but then if you look at that story in context you realize that wasn't what god commanded in fact that was an act of of disbelief really on the part of abraham and sarah they weren't trusting god that he could do what he said he was going to do and then if you look at how god interacts with hagar she is the first person in the bible to give god a name um she calls god the god who sees me and God reveals himself to Hagar and makes promises to Hagar that sort of actually parallel his promises to Abraham. Because mm. in, in the, the culture of the day it would have been completely extraordinary. Like this is, this is a woman and this is a, a slave woman, um, you know, more, moreover. And the God of the universe 
is initiating a special relationship with her. And then we see um, Joseph going into Egypt and we see the entire um, history of God's people being a history of emancipated slaves. So it's not that the Bible is kind of looking at, at slavery um, from the outside. Actually, God's people look at slavery from the inside of the, in the Old Testament, having been slaves themselves. And, and you see um, multiple provisions made for, for slaves in the Old Testament who in um, other cultures would not have had those, those kinds of provisions. And then you see in the New Testament, and I completely love this, um, Paul's letter to Philemon. So again, headline news of Paul, Paul's letter to Philemon is Paul sends a runaway slave back to his master. And you're thinking, okay, there it is. Like the Bible must condone slavery if Paul's sending this runaway slave back to his master. But then you read the letter and you find that Paul uses more affectionate terms for Onesimus, the runaway slave, than for any other individual he writes about. As I mentioned, I mentioned before, he calls Onesimus his very heart. Right. And he says he is like a father to him. And he, he tells Philemon to receive Onesimus as Philemon would receive Paul himself. So he's saying, like in a culture where a runaway slave going back to their master could expect to be beaten and you know massively ill-treated, he's saying, treat this man like a brother, and in fact, like an apostle, like the person you most respect. That's how I want you to treat this man. So the idea that that is um, condoning a practice of slavery, of like dehumanizing and owning another person, is is that she completely subverted in, in Paul's letter to Philemon. And I think we see that recurrently as the Bible talks about slavery. So I think it's it's one of those questions where you have to you have to dig deep and look hard. But actually I think we we end up with a pretty um, a pretty beautiful vision from the scriptures. Well, there, if, as you go through this book, there, you, you've touched on a lot of it, and you haven't uh, sugar-coated any of it. I really appreciate the book. Uh, again, it's C Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. And Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us. You have been a blessing. Thanks so much, Bob. Some people often pray for health, wealth, or a winning score at a football game. But the Bible says wisdom is something we should be praying for. Bishop Kyle seriously believes in the transforming power of praying for wisdom. He wrote about this in his new book, The Secrets of Biblical Wisdom. He joined me via Skype from his church in Montgomery, Alabama to share his viewpoint. You are a big believer in the leadership of vision and encouraging people to be their best. You've written a book called The Secrets of Biblical Wisdom. How do those two things tie together? Well, I hate wasted potential, Bob. It's just something that's always been a, a part of my mind. Uh, I believe we should be all that we can be for God. I look at nature and flowers are made to blossom and bees are made to do what bees do. God creates things with purpose and every one of us are created with purpose. And we've got to capture a vision for what our life is supposed to be about and pursue that vision with great zeal. And wisdom is one of the things that really can propel us toward, toward vision. Uh, the scripture speaks of wisdom in such heights that wisdom is the principal thing. And all you're getting, get wisdom and get understanding. Uh, its price is far above rubies. It's better than strength. It's better than weapons of war. And, and wisdom is put at such a high place that what we need to do is pursue wisdom about our personal calling and destiny and about how to fulfill that which we're created for. Yeah. How, do, how do you identify in, in a person, whether they're in, in a small group or they're sitting in your pew, how do you identify what... Uh, what their purpose really is, what, what you think, what you believe God is calling them to? Well, first of all, our purpose is not so mystical. I think uh, sometimes a lot of people wish that there would be a great voice from heaven saying, Bob, 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 <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're right. Um, but it's really not that mystical. I think our purpose is lodged inside of us and it comes to us through desires. Um, Rick Warren coined the phrase shape, uh, shape. One of the ways you can discern your purpose is by looking at your shape. And you, the S in shape stands for spiritual gifts. The H stands for your heart. How is your heart inclined? What moves you? What doesn't move you? Uh, A stands for attitude. What kind of attitude do you have? Uh, P stands for personality. There are 16 different types of personalities, four major ones. How's your personality wild? In E, your life experiences. So by the time you look at your, your spiritual gifts, your heart, your attitude, your personality, your life experiences, you'll have some clues as to what your purpose is. If you're moved, by injustice, a move when children are treated wrongly, that might be uh, insight into your purpose. If you, like me, burn when people don't fulfill potential, but when you see people maximizing potential and rising up to be all that God wants them to be, that could be a, an insight into what my purpose is. So 
there's a little discovery that has to happen there in finding purpose, but it's not so mystical that we're always waiting on a great deal of revelation that says you're supposed to do this. Uh, Sometimes it's simply that which brings us the greatest joy and maximum fulfillment in life. And as you look at that, there, there was a, a Chinese Christian named Watchman Nee who yeah. wrote, wrote several books. And one of them, he's talking about his, uh, he thinks the, the greatest disappointment in life is the person who, who dies with their hand on the doorknob of the door of opportunity. They never open it up. They never go through it. They're just afraid to turn that doorknob. You believe that's true yeah. of a, a lot of Christians? You know, sadly, I do. Um, Miles Monroe, uh, rest his soul, is another person who, who kind of said the richest place in the world is not Fort Knox, where they keep the gold, and not the diamond mines in South Africa, but the richest place in the world is the graveyard. Because in those graves, there's so much buried potential. So much could have been, should have been, would have been. And I do think that's true. I do think that a lot of people just kind of meander through life, not really latching on to something and making a decision to pursue that which brings them maximum fulfillment. I think a lot of people are taught to get a paycheck uh, and to do what it takes to pay the bills but not live. And we, we, we have to maximize potential. Or a better way to put it is we have to blossom into all that God made us to become. It, it, you said through all you're getting, get wisdom, which is what the Bible tells us. How do, how do yes. you... How do you uh, how do you lead people into, into gaining that wisdom? To, I mean, you've got people in your church that are all, all levels of, of, of their walk with Christ. How do you encourage them and how do you equip them to, to really get true biblical wisdom? You know, I have an interesting concept about wisdom. Hear me out. Uh, some may agree, some may disagree. But, but I, I think wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is kind of how to apply knowledge. There's a certain degree of intangibility to wisdom. Um, you, you can't just go, go get a book and get wisdom. You can get knowledge, but wisdom is different. So Solomon goes to sleep and has a dream. And in the dream, God says, ask me whatever you want. And he says, okay, give me a wise and understanding heart. We know the story. God was so pleased with that. He gave him that. He gave him riches and so forth. So Solomon wakes up the next morning, the richest, the wealthiest, I'm sorry, the, the most wise person in all the world, richest, wealthiest, and the most wise person in all the world. So what happened? Did God expand his brain? put all the encyclopedias of the world in his brain? Did God download all the information that we have access to on Google? No, what I believe happened is that a portal of revelation opened so that whenever Solomon looked at something, he had understanding as to what it was. He had insight as to what it was. Uh, George Washington Carver had a very interesting thing that happened to him. He was in church one day and he says, God, show me the secrets of the universe. And the Lord said to him, that's too big. Your mind can't contain that. Then he said, well, show me the secrets of human beings. And he said, that's too much for you. You can't contain that. So the story's told he gets upset. He walks out, sits on a park bench and saw a peanut on the ground and picked it up, said, well, show me the secrets of the peanut. God said, now you can handle that. So that gives expression to pre peanut brain. But anyway, very, very <laughs> you said people, you can handle yeah, that. <laughs> but very few people could have handled that. But George Washington Carver was able to handle that. Yeah, he was able to handle it. So God unpacks those secrets. And I believe what happens is he looks at the peanut and God begins to give him wisdom and insight into that. So there's an unfolding of information that comes to you when, when the spirit of wisdom is upon you. Bob? So, so uh, gaining wisdom isn't just an instantaneous, I now have wisdom. It, it is a, it's a walk and a step of faith and I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grow in wisdom? Correct. It is a walk, a step of faith. It's going to grow in wisdom. Uh, it, it reminds me of Adam in the book of Genesis when God creates the animals and brought them to Adam to see what Adam would call them. That's a very interesting dynamic. God created the animal. Adam had to name it. So he had to have insight into the character, the nature, the programming of the animal so, so that Adam could give it a particular name. How did that happen? I think there was some kind of exchange. That's what I call wisdom. So wisdom is somewhat in some ways intangible. And every time I see in the Bible, we ask for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And God unfolds that. God gives wisdom. And I, I really believe that's the primary way wisdom is gained, by asking. You think there's a lot of wasted effort and maybe wasted energy when people step into what they believe is their vision and they really don't have wisdom in that case. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, no, knowing how to do something is a whole lot better than, uh, than guessing or spending a lot of time. The, the story's told about Henry Ford, who uh, had some machines in his factory that were broken. And a guy came to try to fix them, and he looked at it, and he just looked at it, and he took a hammer, and he hit it in one place, and the machine started working. 
he sent him a bill for $29,000. And he's, Henry Ford just went off, said, I'm not going to pay this $29,000. He said, explain to me what this is for. So he sent back and he said, $1 for coming to the shop, $28,999 for knowing where to hit the machine. <laughs> he paid the invoice. In other words, knowing how to do something is a whole lot better. Uh, so you never waste time sharpening your sword or sharpening your axe. That's time well spent. You see a lot of people responding to that, responding to your call to wisdom and your call to, to finding out God's vision for their life. A lot of people in your church respond to it. There is a tremendous need. The number one question people said they would ask God if they got a chance to ask him one question is, what is my purpose? What am I here for? And how do I fulfill what I'm called to do? There's a real big need for that. So there's a tremendous response for people wanting to understand that. Well, Bishop, thank you for being with us. Where can they get the book, The Secrets of Biblical Wisdom? Where can they get that? Amazon has it. They can go to my website, kylecearcy.com, and the book's available for whoever wants it. Patrick Kolbeck is a father and engineer who took a call from God to run and serve two terms in the State House in Michigan. One of his major battles as a believer was the state of the education system. He joined me from his home near Detroit to tell me more about his viewpoint of why we need to fight for Christian values to be taught in our public schools. Been waiting for this, Patrick, because I want to talk to you about education in America. I know that's one of the things you were concerned about as a, as a state senator from Michigan was the yeah. whole core curriculum. Absolutely. I was uh, one of the, probably the most vocal opponent to Common Core standards in the state of Michigan. Um, had legislation that uh, we're trying to move through in a Republican-controlled Senate, and a Republican-controlled House, mm -hmm. and a Republican uh, governor that couldn't get off the dime and uh, couldn't get moved through the system, which was very frustrating. And it kind of shows that there's a lot of people that want that top-down control of our students. And I believe that the only way you're really going to get educational excellence and is, is when you actually pursue it at the local level with students, teachers, and parents. Do you see, and we'll ask about... Uh about core, do you see that as a as, as kind of bringing everybody down to mediocrity, or do you see it as more as an, an indoctrination system as opposed to education? Where do you see the greatest the greatest danger in, in that whole Common Core? But well, I think it's about control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Once you start having a national um, standard, and it's not a, technically a federal standard, they've got incentives at the federal government and statutes to go off and incentivize its deployment, but technically it's a national standard. Um, Education is kind of a five-layer cake, if you will. And that's the way I like to explain it. You got the standards bone connected to the assessment bone, connected to the curriculum bone, connected to the lesson plans and the uh, course materials. Everything flows downstream from those standards. Um, and so uh, essentially you control that top tier, you control everything below it as well. And, and in many respects, this whole common core deployment is a big money grab from the folks who stand to make money with new assessments from new course materials, from new books, um, uh, lesson plans. There's a lot of money to be had into that, and they're more than happy to go off and provide those materials for a price. Yeah. Um, so all the folks that are clamoring for more education dollars, because it happens all across the country on it, maybe start looking at where we're actually spending the money right now. And I'll tell you, um, you know, a lot of the old methods we had, particularly around math and English language arts, were working pretty darn well. When you were out stumping, uh, running for, for Senate, and you're knocking on doors, what were you hearing from parents and, uh, and teachers especially? What were you hearing from parents and teachers about the education system? Well, I, it had to improve. And, and there's a lot of, um, there's kind of like a lot of false red herrings out there around education, everything on funding in particular. In the state of Michigan, you know, we've got uh, um, compensation levels for, for our teachers overall is actually, I think, ranked number five in the nation. But you wouldn't know it from the from what you hear from folks. So, if you go to morninginmichigan.com, I actually put out one of my last uh, mailers that I put out as a Michigan senator um, dealt specifically with education. I tracked the whole funding history of it, but I also get into some other areas that are near and dear to my heart, which are discussion of the standards, not just Common Core, but something that's a little bit more insidious around social studies and science standards mm -hmm. that I think is important to bring up as well. Um, and if you go to morningmichigan.com and click on what's going on in education, you'll get access to that because I have a feeling the same stuff has happened in other states as well. I mean, originally the education system had a, in, in, this, in this country, had a Christian worldview. Yeah. And admittedly, we're, we're a lot more diverse uh, nation now, and the world yeah. the worldview is a lot more global. Uh, <clears throat> where do you think that whole worldview is shifting to? Oh, it's definitely towards a totalitarian government or progressive ideology on it. 
Um, you, you see it evident in some of the changes that were made between what we put together as politically neutral standards in the 2018 versus the 2019. The specific changes that were made um, is that they used to have just a dedicated section on the growth of Islam in our, in our um, uh, standards. I said, you know, if you're going to have a dedicated section on the growth of Islam, I think we should have a dedicated section on the growth of Christianity. As, as you pointed out, that's kind of our roots. And so people should understand the history of our nation related to that. Um, in the changes that they put forward for the 2019 standards, they took out the dedicated section on Christianity, left in the one on Islam. They also added a section in civil rights on LGBT rights as a civil right. I go, that's fine. You can talk about that, you know. But when you do, you need to talk about religious conscience rights. That's something that's actually in our Constitution right now mm -hmm. um, as a specifically enumerated protection. And you're not even teaching that. That's where all the conflict is in our courts right now. And if you don't teach that, you're only teaching one worldview. And when the kids come out, they're going to be a bunch of snowflakes because they can't debate both sides of the issue in an adult manner. We were able to do that with the progressives when I was in that focus group. We had very professional adult conversations on some very sensitive topic. I mean, religion and politics kind mm -hmm. of as, uh, as difficult as it gets. And we had great conversations. When it got out into the media and when it got out into um, the uh, campaign season, all of a sudden it took on a much different tenor. Sure. Yeah, get, th then they want to begin to label you. and, and oh, it's yeah. a, it, it's a, it can be a very, very painful thing. I can see it in the book. <laughs> uh, you and your wife both met some wonderful people in, in this journey. But it's also very, very painful. What would you suggest to the next engineer, the next school teacher, the next person coming up that God says, I want you to get involved in the political realm? Well, first and foremost, start living your life in a manner that you are expecting others to live. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's kind of another way of saying love your neighbors as yourself. It's a little bit different perspective on it. So if you want people to be following the Constitution, for example, then... Maybe read the Constitution. If you want, if you want to be more uh, Christ-like in, in how they conduct themselves, then maybe read what Christ actually had to say about what he was expecting of us. And then the next thing is go off and study your civics. Get back into the Constitution. Get back into, uh, uh, I mean, even read the state Constitution. A lot of people don't read their state uh, Constitutions. <laughs> and many people don't even know what's in their United States Constitution mm -hmm. besides the preamble. Um, and or that we've got three branches of government, but there's a lot more in there that, that highlights yeah. um, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves as legislator. Get spun up on that, and then hold people accountable to the oaths that they took. Right. Go off and do your evaluation of the bills. And by the way, if you don't like what you're seeing, pray about it, get down on your knees, and if God's asking you to run, get in there, because we need good, principled public servants. The purpose of Viewpoint is to discuss the many questions people have about the Bible and how we can find answers for today's difficult problems. And we appreciate the amazing response we've had on this show, including being recognized by the International Christian Film and Music Festival as the best TV show. Viewpoint is produced totally from the financial gifts of viewers like you. So we'd appreciate you continuing to support this show by making a donation to WTLW.com. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast.